Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Disruption is Here to Stay, What to Demand from Your Manufacturing Software Vendor. My name is Megan, and I'll be your moderator today. Today, for our agenda, our speakers will be discussing, first, how the manufacturing industry has fundamentally changed, then what you should demand from your manufacturing software vendors, and lastly, specific questions to ask vendors during the RFP process and what you may be missing. And now I'm excited to introduce our speakers. Jason Dietrich is the head of commercial operations here at Tulip. Jason's role includes the management of Tulip's go-to-market strategy, including direct and indirect sales, as well as operationally managing Tulip's customer success, customer support, and customer service organizations. Pablo Tosta has spent over 16 years in the manufacturing industry and the last seven years helping companies successfully embrace digital and cultural transformation at Tulip by adopting digital tools and human-centric apps uh, to improve their business outcomes and achieve their business objectives. Take it away, speakers. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this uh, session. I'm going to take the first section here and start to talk about, you know, how the manufacturing industry has fundamentally changed, you know, in terms of shifts in the industry, as well as, you know, trends that are impacting the way manufacturers operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, let's kind of start with the, the landscape itself and, and how it's evolving. We think it's evolving due to a variety of factors that include, you know, a much more focused on the frontline worker, you know, this idea of some blurred tech stacks, and certainly the adoption of cloud. So if I take each one of these individually, let's start with frontline focus. You know, the premise that we have as a company, you know, Tulip's main premise is that 70% of the errors that happen in an operational setting are caused by humans. And we're seeing more and more manufacturers think about how do they develop their technology or their process or how do they deploy systems that really help that frontline worker become less error prone. You know, when we think about the tech stacks, uh, you know, for those who've been around this industry for a while, you know everything from your sensors and machines and hardware at kind of level zero, level one, to your historians and HMI SCADA, to MES systems, to ultimately your business systems at level four. We think this is really, you know, new technology has blurred this stack. You know, with the adoption of Internet of, of Things technologies, you know, with no code and low code technologies like Tulip, you know, we're seeing that this mix of where you fit in, in this landscape has, has really changed and, and people are now looking at new ways to think about deploying software, no longer looking backwards at the way of the past. And then finally, it, it's clear that Microsoft and AWS have really impacted the market. These large platform providers are certainly getting adoption in manufacturing. And we think that cloud native offerings that, that you know, work and work closely with these large platform providers are, are going to be the new technology of the future. In addition to kind of the manufacturing technology stack changing and the impact of, of focusing on that frontline worker, we're also seeing this triple squeeze that's impacting companies you know, around the globe. The triple squeeze, as, as Gartner kind of has talked about, are, are really these three areas. You know, inflation, which has certainly been disruptive to managing people's costs, you know, managing what they have to charge their customers for a certain good or service. Supply chain disruption, you know, many manufacturers have, have dealt with the fact that they have a high degree of demand but can't supply within the time cycles they need to to keep their customer satisfaction high. And labor shortage is something we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of years, but it's it's been more of an issue recently with this major gap that we're seeing for manufacturers to get qualified people who want to be in manufacturing. And because of this triple squeeze, it's making companies fundamentally think differently about how they're going to manufacture and how they're going to operate to meet the needs of their customers. So what are the implications of these shifts in the industry, whether that's the technology you know, change and the kind of blurring of the lines, the triple squeeze impacts? The first is that efficiency is Im important to manage the knowns. So companies have really focused on productivity and efficiency, and it's certainly something that you, you need to do to make sure you're, you're hitting your targets profitably. But dealing with the knowns right now is, is not something that you can just do when you're managing your business. There are unknowns creeping up every day that are impacting the way you operate. So manufacturers really need to be able to adapt to the unknowns. You know, how do they have something that helps them manage 
um, that productivity and efficiency for the things that they know they can control, but how are they prepared and be agile enough for the things that they don't know that's going to happen in terms of market shifts and you know economic considerations and so on. So resilience and adaptability are now the priority. So when we talk to you know operating officers and people who run facilities, you know people who are focusing on the bottom line, they say, look, we're going to continue to focus on productivity and efficiency, but we have to be resilient and we have to be able to adapt to change on the fly. So the core fundamental change that we're seeing in 2023 that manufacturers, the way they buy and implement software has changed forever. And there really is no going back. You know, companies have already started their digital transformation journey. They've started to look at new technology. They started to look at the cloud. They started to think about new ways of buying software. And, and we just don't see it going back to the, the days of buying, you know, traditional monolithic systems. And with that, you know, let, let's break that prediction down into kind of those three components. You know, moving to the cloud is finally coming to manufacturing. I would actually say it's it's already come and now it's actually becoming clearly companies feeling very comfortable with running mission critical processes in the cloud. So th this has been a fundamental change over the last few years. I would say, you know, five to seven years ago, you, you weren't seeing manufacturers being comfortable running in the cloud on, on what they consider to be those mission critical activities. But with the adoption of new technology at the business level to now new technologies, making their software offerings cloud native from day one, it's it's no longer kind of a an area of, of risk. It's an area of opportunity for manufacturers as they see it. Number two, you know, owning software is what we're saying is dead. You know, buying perpetual software, paying an annual support fee. Um, you know, it's really an idea of the past. Companies now believe so software as a service is the de facto standard on how they're going to acquire software. It really gives them the advantage of, of buying what they need at the time they need it, making sure they're getting value from it. It really gives optionality to the end customer to decide if it's working for them, they're going to continue and they're going to renew and hopefully expand. And if it's not working for them or giving them the value that they expected, then they move on and they can move on to something new. Um, so we really believe that buying cycle and the way people buy has changed fundamentally. And then the final thing we would say is the traditional professional services model, kind of the, uh, uh, the old style of a V-curve implementation where you do user requirements, functional requirements, you design, you test, you implement, and it takes you 12 to 18 months to deploy. We think that's no longer a model that's going to work for manufacturers and operators. We really believe that short, iterative, value-based engagements that are really designed to empower self-service is what's really starting to take hold and will be how manufacturers evaluate software technologies going forward. So like we've talked about, we always say manufacturers have to be more productive, more efficient. You know, They need to be able to make more with less input. So that productivity and efficiency is important and establishing the right infrastructure to empower their teams to be as efficient and productive as possible is still clear. But like we've talked about, resilience and adaptability are, are kind of those new trends that we're seeing manufacturers think about in conjunction with being productive and efficient. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pablo, who's going to take us into what you should demand from your manufacturing software vendors, and he's going to get us kicked off here in the section two. Thank you, Jason. So basically leading from the previous comment on the demand is changing. So let, let's take a look at uh, how traditional systems are actually um, getting replaced by this new way of actually deploying and, and, and referencing new ways of, uh, of, of implementing, right? So first of all, the, the evaluation process has been always lengthy and the highest impact as to after the evaluation process is when it comes to the implementation. But by the time that that implementation is already um, you know, moving forward, then the, the value add of that platform actually decreases, right? So basically once the system is implemented and the value is realized, that value begins to diminish, which is you know, on that 12 month uh, mark that we see here in the graph. So what happens is now people are starting to look for point solutions and um, different professional services to basically um, address those issues that are arising directly from the operation, right? 
And this basically leads to data silos and disconnected workflows and processes until the next system upgrade of that traditional system, right? Which often basically addresses some gaps, right? Until the next iteration of that, uh, of that system comes into place, right? So what we're seeing is basically this translates into common challenges that we're actually outlining here because frontline workers are completing complex tasks manually with uh, little to no support, right? Then, as mentioned before, we start seeing siloed data structures, which basically prevent people from the floor for rapid responses to any of the external changes. And those external changes could be supply chain changes or demand changes, customization of product, et cetera. There's also vendor bottlenecks that we're seeing um, basically automated process fail to empower the human, the person that's actually performing the job that's critical for your manufacturing process. Then of course, costly implementations arise. And then also the technology starts to rely on third party integrations that are no longer valid or delay the ability to experiment changes, rapid changes in the process. And then all of these challenges basically introduce different, um, different solutions that actually will adapt faster, right? What is, what is that, right? Well, they actually address some of the uh, issues that arise, right? So for example, I mentioned uh, things that are not, or solutions or interfaces that are not adapted to the human. So what are the different capabilities that um, will actually provide that aligned with a human-centric approach, the agility to adapt, um, basically given the power to the person that owns the process to develop apps, which is this concept of citizen development, right? And then also everything that comes with it, which is contextualizing the data. Once you implement an application that's actually looking at the process instead of, um, you know, adapting to the process instead of the other way around, and then implementation and innovating as you actually adapt to it. So basically this, uh, this the, the summary of it is as traditional service heavy MES solutions have failed to adapt to modern challenges. And it's the, also the way in which you adopt this type of technology has to change. And this is the proposal that we're putting in front. Yeah, thanks, Pablo. So I think, you know, I've talked about resiliency. We've talked about productivity and efficiency. When I think about what you need to demand of your software vendor to help you with resiliency, we, we've highlighted many things, you know, throughout research. But for today, we're going to kind of focus on, on these handful the first thing is you have to have agility and whatever software technology you decide to move forward in your manufacturing or operational setting. You know, that means the ability to respond quickly, update your system as you make any necessary changes to your process. So because of these impacts from outside conditions and outside forces, you know, companies have to change, you know, very rapidly how they manufacture, how their process is going to be organized, and therefore their software technology needs to adapt quickly to those changes. To, to Pablo's last point, you know, traditional systems are a 12 to 15 to 24 month deployment. To his point, you get to a point where you've gone live and now all of a sudden you wanna move that to site number two or site number three. And the work to do that uh, is tough. You know, you end up doing a lot of rework, you end up doing additional customizations. And now all of a sudden you're managing multiple systems in multiple sites that are no longer similar. And it took you 12 to 15 to 24 months to start even seeing it go live, which means your value is only happening, you know, post that go live time. We believe faster time to value is critical. How do you get immediate value? How do you maintain consistent growth? How do you solve problems in real time that give you value immediately? We think that you have to have a scalable platform, you know, the ability to start small, but expand over time. And again, solve problems that give you value, let your people in, those manufacturing facilities identify areas of concern and let's address those quickly. And then finally, flexibility, the ability to adjust your data structures to fit your needs. There's really no other way around it. You, you can't have a monolithic system with a, 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 a predefined table set and predefined data structure that doesn't give you the flexibility to meet the needs that are happening again, day to day in your facilities. Yeah, for sure. So, so, uh, focusing on the faster time to value, it's basically uh, ties to that point where, okay, if you're actually 
um, implementing a system that's actually it takes 18 months to to see the outcome uh, then I think the the, the, the the process has failed at some point right so what we're proposing is basically the faster how do you actually achieve that faster time to value and it's with this concept of comp composability right so incremental rollouts where solutions are composed over time is the approach right it is an adaptable digitization strategy for ensuring production op operations are resilient and agile, right? And it's also leveraging cloud-based deployments and software as a, as, a, as a system, right? Because what you're doing is basically transferring that um, ownership, software ownership to uh, the cloud, right? And what's different? Well, this, this approach is about leading with business impact, right? It's breaking down the problem into parts that can be delivered fast in real time, which makes me think also about how you, how you adapt lean manufacturing, right, to your production processes. Basically, you can't eat the elephant in one piece. You have to actually, you know, um, break it down into, into small pieces. And that's the difference about this approach, is that composability that will actually give you that incremental rollout in order to achieve your... your um, your your goals even faster yeah i think what i'd add pablo too is you know this knowns versus unknowns you know we've talked about that being disruptive and you know if you if you can deal with your known problems but have the flexibility of a platform to help you solve those unknowns when they crop up in real time because they're unknown you truly don't know they're coming when they do you have a you have a platform and a set of technologies that help you address those quickly Right, and and that's also you know it makes me think about the hidden factory, right? Also, yes. you're uncovering those those unknowns, you know, which which are the traditional hidden factory. So another important point that you brought up was uh, the user experience, right? And, and they call it the UX, right? So basically, what we're proposing is optimize user experience because you, your ability to provide the experience simple guidance, simple UIs that can change rapidly, give you data inputs that you need from the person actually performing the job. In addition to that, you tie it up with technology, which if you have machine learning capability, you're actually incorporating the technology as needed right? because you want to help the front worker, you want to aid the human because they are the ones that are adding value to your process, not the other way around. And then also that ties into the citizen development functionality. And then what we talked about, the cl cloud functionality, right? So it's how the technology serves the human instead of the other way around, right? Yeah, and I think, again, I, what I would add is to simply, you know, we're, we're really think, seeing and, and feeling that companies are starting to focus on who is that frontline worker? How do we help them get trained more quickly? How do we get them to be more operationally efficient. And ultimately, it really comes down to their user experience uh, and how adaptable is it to meet the needs of them on day to day. So I, I think you covered it well. Yeah, so, so basically this quote actually is exactly that, right? So who, when you're deploying this type of uh, this application, right? so first call, your, your number one customer actually the person that's uh, operating a machine, uh, assembling, um, the, your final product. So basically, what uh, Sophia was actually actually able to do here, they uh, she went out on the floor, got all that information, deployed application was actually good based on their feedback, and then that iterative process started right, continuously improving the application that never ends, right? But they're able to collect all the data that is critical to improve even the, the broader process, either upstream or downstream of that production flow, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about Stanley Black and & Decker and, and the buy-in that we have, you know, around citizen development, building applications that are focused on ultimately who's gonna use it. And I think that a lot of traditional systems were really built from kind of a thinking about the business user and they, they worked way, their way down to the to the plant floor or the shop floor, what we've really done is flipped it on its head and said, no, let's really truly focus on who's the person gonna use the technology? How do we make it as easy as possible that, for them to learn and operate day to day? And I think Stanley Black & Decker's done a great job of doing this with their operators. This leads to the third session of the webinar, which is basically 
what are the questions you should ask your vendor in our process? Because, you know, as Jason mentioned before, facility, agility, adaptability are top of mind in our theme right now. So here we have three, uh, one poll with three options. And then the question is, do you have your operational priorities established before you complete a manufacturing software vendor RFP? The first option is yes, our team is fully aligned on our implementation priorities and operational priorities before uh, beginning the RFP process. Our team is well aligned, but there's room for improvement. Uh, no, and then the last option is no, our implementation process is often driven by the vendor's established capabilities. And it looks like around 60% uh, say our team is well aligned, but there's room for improvement. Around 33% say no, uh, our implementation process is often driven by the vendor's established capabilities. And uh, only 8% of the respondents have said 100% yes, our team is fully aligned. So I think that has a, uh, a lot to say here in um, how people should think about their RFP creation. Yeah, I think we're going to get into it with the next slide with Pablo, but, you know, I, I'm not surprised. And what I would say is, you know, we fundamentally are, are trying to help, you know, manufacturers think about their next generation of software to really think about how do you have tools that adapt to your process, not vice versa, which we'll cover in more detail here. But I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that for the most part, people kind of go into the RFP process with a, a set of capabilities and a matrix they're thinking about, but haven't really focused on in advance, kind of what are your high priority areas and let's make sure that the company you're selecting can really meet those quickly and, and, and meet those fully. We, we, we try to think about business impact and ease of implementation. So obviously the things in the top right are high impact and easy to implement. That's what we call the low hanging fruit. Um, if you go to the bottom left, you know, now you're talking about it's, it's hard to implement and it's low impact. So we'd say, you know, kind of proceed with caution. Um, so, you know, ultimately it's, it's this idea of how do you start to prioritize the areas that are going to give you the most value in, in your organization? And let's start with those things that, we know we can implement, implement quickly, get value from quickly, and, and certainly have an impact on your business. So the next point is basically addressing the areas that are could be missing from, from your RFP template, right? You may be missing important questions like, are you, does your platform provide enough uh, features to equip the frontline workers? Um, are you able to actually remove IT bottlenecks? Does your platform provide an agile and uh, low-risk implementation, right, that we can basically adapt uh, to the process and the changes in the production environment, right? And then also, do you have any type of contextualized data uh, uh, way of, of adapting and, and integrating and avoiding silos, right? And then also the last one, which is the, the most important, is how you can, can you avoid unnecessary costs, like implementation costs or additional add-ons, et cetera, et cetera. So, the first one is basically how you, you equip uh, frontline workers, right? Are you actually equipping, equipping your frontline workers to, with, with tools that are actually addressing and adding value? So one of the things that uh, we really focus on is the onboarding and the adoption process of the platform. So what's the, it, 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 what's the ease of development? What's the ease of training? What's the ease of use? So providing the right tools for the person that are our um, the people that are actually developing the apps, but also the nice UI for the worker to interact with it. And that's including the adaptability to the need and ad 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 adaptability and that need can actually be changing over time. And then the second point that it's like really important and I'd like to highlight from this, the, the, this, this slide is, are you really empowering your teams to collect data from the source, right? Because sometimes it's, a, it's the periphery or we can actually have a very complicated UI in front of the workers and they're not using it. How can you actually provide a right, the right tool so they can use it and adapt it to their day-to-day -day without affecting the cycle time and providing value in, in some, some way or fashion? The other part that we mentioned was like, how can you remove bottle, IT bottlenecks? That's, I think, an, an important key factor uh, of an RFP. So one of the questions could be, what's the spent ratio between software and services, right? 
traditional systems require high services spend. The other one could be how, how much do you actually rely on your IT team to make the changes, right? I think, and, and we think here, the mentality of the Tulip is that you transfer that ownership to the process owners and the SMEs. The operators are the SMEs, and then you could have engineers or quality engineers and manufacturing engineers on the floor that could help the operators um, to do the, their job a little bit easier with better UIs. So they own the, the UIs and the app development to adapt and change. That's basically the lean manufacturing mentality adapted to the floor. I think you tied those two to well together. I think, you know, that, that frontline worker, which we, we think again, you know, when you're, when you're talking about a manufacturing or operational setting, the person doing the tasks, the person collecting the data, the person doing the work and executing that work, we feel they've been a little bit underserved. And I think your two slides here, when, when, when I think about an RFP that the RFPs we get, a lot of times it is focused on, you know, the, what are your software costs, what are your services costs? And we're going to talk a little bit about that spend on the next slide. But I think this interaction of how does IT support those operations folks and, and, and these two slides you've covered kind of bring those together. And I think as you're thinking about your next gen software acquisition, making sure the frontline worker is supported by IT, but also that the frontline worker can provide input to IT so that they, they blend better together in terms of how an actual deployment will, will ultimately, ultimately provide value to the company. And it also ties to uh, a, a comment that you said before that traditionally the systems, basically you need to adapt your process to the system instead of the other way around. In this ever-changing uh, structure and, and demands for manufacturing, it's, it's, it's the system, right, that needs to be flexible to the process that's always changing. So it's key when you actually have that, you know, uh, synergy between a, uh, the, the, the frontline worker and the demand from the frontline worker and, and your IT to support the systems that you put in front of the people that are actually performing the tasks, right? Which basically leads to the next one, which is, you know, are you, do you have an agile uh, implementation methodology? Do you have a low risk implementation methodology? Because it's like, if you fail, well, what's the impact? What's the financial impact there? Right, so one of the questions is like, how soon will I see the value of your platform, of your solution, right? How easy is it, is it actually, uh, how adaptable is your solution to the changes in processes and the products, right, that are evolving? The other, the other part is like, all right, now initially, okay, if it's adaptable, you're saying it's, it's, it, it's all these great things. Do you actually offer a free trial or a low risk pilot program so that we can get our hands on what you're saying that you're so great about, right? So basically putting the honesty card on the table and saying, hey, Mr. Vendor, show me your product. I really want to feel your product and test it so that I can actually get a, you know, a, a feel of what it actually does at scale, right? No, that's great. Thanks, Pablo. I, I think we, we kind of talked a lot about how we think you know, the value creation has to happen early the deployment cycle has to be agile. You have to be able to solve problems quickly. So I think, you know, you, you covered some of these questions well, and, and hopefully people are thinking about these as part of their next evaluation process. When I, when I think about data, um, ultimately, you know, data becomes king in, in terms of, of how people make decisions. And, you know, a lot of companies can collect data and, and store that data. The, 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 real, the real key to any you know, data plan and how you're going to access this data is, you know, what, what are you going to do to make decisions with it? So, you know, does your solution enable us to ensure consistency across factories? You know, making sure that if you're an enterprise who has multiple facilities, that you can really standardize things like key performance indicators and, and how you capture data. And, and when that data is contextualized, that you can start to piece together a story that, that no longer looks at a given cell or a given machine or, a, a, you know, a given area of facility, but really across the enterprise. Um, and that's that holistic view of operations. Is it easy to add new data sources? You know, can you connect to a variety of things, whether those are sensors, machines, cameras, other data inputs that are meaningful to that frontline worker? And, you know, what type of real-time data, you know, are we capable of providing? So there's, there's a whole host of questions you can ask around data and the con contextualization of that data, but we think it's certainly a, a clear piece of, of your decision process. 
And then avoiding unnecessary costs. Um, you know, this kind of goes back a little bit to when you're thinking about what's the cost of deployment, but to us, and going back to that, we think that people are not going to go backwards in terms of how they make decisions. We believe that SaaS is certainly here to stay. Cloud is here to stay. Not doing long, you know, large implementation projects is, you know, it's it's a way of the past. So when you think about your cost profile and your total cost of ownership, the first thing you have to think about, what are my upfront costs? So how do I acquire software? Do I need to buy hardware? Do I need infrastructure? You know, what is that implementation cost going to look like? What are my ongoing costs, you know, on an annual basis? Um, what are my internal costs to manage my infrastructure? So how much support is there just to manage, you know, my, my database and my applications and deploying those applications, you know, across my site. So we just want you to think about, it's not just your initial spend and your support costs. There's a lot that goes into what's my overall total cost of ownership. And we certainly believe that that's something that should be contemplated as you're making your next decision. Jason, just to add something really quick here, we the the sections that we just outlined. If you take it from a high level and see what how it's actually categorized, basically it's the human experience, then the IT, and then data and cost. Right. So those four points are the key pillars to what we think it's choosing uh, the next generation of your systems, right? Which I think um, the traditional MES approach is is falling behind on all of this. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so the last couple of slides are just gonna kind of bring home the message here. You know, we've talked a lot about what you should be thinking about when you evaluate a potential software platform or a system that you plan to deploy in your, in your factories, um, you know, and we've, we've kind of talked through, if you're gonna go through an RFP process, um, these are the things you should consider. We, we would actually challenge whether or not the traditional RFP process is even still valid. Um, it, you know, in most cases, you know, they're, they're missing the operational context of how specific solutions fit into your organization's unique processes. So in other words, you know, you build a, a matrix, you wanna know does it do X functionality? You haven't really thought about that grid as being very tied to your priorities, you know, per the poll. We, we think that there's there's a new kind of way to do this, which is, you know, one is focus first on the priorities that you've identified that are high value, easy to implement, and make sure that you're, if you're going to go through a review process, that those are clearly weighted properly. And make sure whatever you're doing, that you're not buying a system that is gonna force you to change the way you do things. You really want a system that can adapt to the way you do things. You're the manufacturing experts, you have the manufacturing engineering capacity to, to build your process the way you think is best and most efficient. So make sure you're thinking about will the solution meet that and not have you have to make changes to the way you do business. So the question is, do you have to change your process to fit your systems or can your systems adapt and, and make sure they meet your exact process? So what that really means for the manufacturing industry is it's it's really shifting to composability. Um, you know, the, the ability to be able to adapt quickly, iterate, solve problems, deal with your knowns and your unknowns. The way you do that is through composability. And, you know, Gartner's put out some research that talks about composability going from, you know, very low single digits within, you know, organizations to, you know, 25, 30 percent over the coming years. So we think composability is really just getting started, but because of that triple squeeze, because of the impact on, on businesses and, and this need for you know, quick adaptability and adoption of new technology, we, we, we think it's clearly you know, here to stay. And, and what we mean by composability, what does it look like? We think composability are apps that were built for purpose to solve a given need and a given problem. It could be things like production visibility, you know, guided assembly and work instructions, you know, really helping that operator be more productive, making sure they're not making errors and that they're doing all the tasks we need them to do to execute. You know, doing machine monitoring and machine performance, you know, making sure we're connecting to your machinery, providing guidance on their availability and their performance and ultimately OEE. But this idea of, of visibility and ensuring productivity and efficiency. And then you get into other areas of the, of the business that you might not have thought of that, you know, you might be doing other systems or you might be able to fill a gap in an area of your business, but 
you know, managing inventory, doing audits or line clearance or safety rounds. Uh, the idea of doing pack and ship, you know, doing simple processes to make sure that the end of the line that we're doing the things necessary to integrate to your warehouse management, your ERP system. So composability to us is you're building applications that solve unique problems that are built for purpose for your needs, but using a common platform that's enterprise grade and gives you all the plumbing to do this very easily. Pablo, anything you want to add to this slide as I lose my voice? I think I, yeah, <laughs> I think I would reference back to the quadrant too, right? Where you have on the x-axis, you have ease of uh, implementation. And then on the y-axis, you have business impact. I was thinking about that, right? So on the top, top corner, top right corner, you have the low hanging fruit. So that's you know the the where the composability and ease of implementation with high business impact comes into play, right? So if you see it, you know we say guided assembly it could be production visibility. So, but that ties into where do I start and how do I actually grow that? And that's the concept of composability. You start with a very small high impact use case and then build from there. Yeah, thanks for adding that. And I would also say composability is, is not only everything we've said, but it's also how the operator interacts with those applications. You know, you, you want to make it as accessible as possible. So, you know, being able to be mobile, being able to be at a workstation, being able to run in a browser, you know, more traditional ways of deployment. So, you know, you want it to be flexible such that those folks who are inside the four walls of manufacturing can access these applications, but also those that are dealing with stranded assets or doing rounds that might not traditionally be inside the four walls, but are equally important to us, you know, you know, giving them access to the tools they need. So I, I kind of noted this earlier, you know, we basically said in, in, in 2022, less than 2% of manufacturing operations applications are using composable technology, but by 2025, it's at least 25%. I think I not noted 25 to 30. So, you know, we see this already happening in real time certainly with customers we're working with, but even as we get new RFPs or new, uh, you know, companies coming to us to, to understand our, our technology better, they're coming forward and saying, you know, we need composability. And what that what it means, we've kind of covered this, I would say, you know, in, in more detail, I'll kind of let you read it, but composable manufacturing apps are built partly or wholly as, as a, you know, flexible assemblies, you know, uh, of well encapsulated modules. So again, it's this idea of how do you use um, a platform to quickly build things that are going to be, you know, built for purpose for your needs that you can quickly deploy and get value from quickly. So with that, I think we're we're at the final slide here to make sure we we kind of hammer home our critical themes. I'll let you finish this up, Pablo. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So just to basically summarize, and you know, uh, the ideas that we want everyone to 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 take home, it's basically. The first one is uh, service heavy vendors have failed to adapt in modern manufacturing challenges. And then how you adapt this is actually with technology that changes, right? With the, the changes in manufacturing, basically. The other, the other part is that traditional RFPs are missing the operational context, right? Of how the solution can fit into your organization's processes. What that means is that the traditional RFP process basically is is not looking at the critical issues from your production. So in order to do that, you have to ask the right questions and not even the traditional you know, spreadsheet with a bunch of you know, 150 questions might not be the right solution, right? Hear them out, hear your vendors, let them present, let them demo, you know, feel it, get a free trial instead of just like letting, you know, put everything on a spreadsheet, which is, uh, it, it opens a gap between like the real operational problems that you're trying to solve and what you're trying to address in writing. What I've been encouraging a lot of our, you know, customers and those that are evaluating our platform is I basically say, look, you know, by the time you evaluate seven or 10 or 15 vendors and, and go through the process of, of 150 questions and, and maybe haven't not done that prioritization in advance, I'd say, do a proof of value. You'll be within, you know, eight weeks, twelve weeks max. You're you're you've already used the technology. You see how it works. You're already determining if you get value and if it fits your needs. It's low risk. It it gets you going quickly, and you can evaluate several vendors in that in that capacity and really start to get to the point where, 
um, you're making decisions and, 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 and saving your time and a lot of effort in, in terms of the evaluation process. So that's why I kind of hinted that I don't know that a traditional RFP process is actually ending with the best result. The best results I've seen companies is they, they do proof of value and, and very quickly can, can determine, you know, fit or not fit. No, exactly. That, that's exactly true. That the, the most, the highest success that we have seen as a company too, is when that happens is that when the customer already comes with um, a set of ideas uh, in a traditional RFP process and we disrupt that process and say like, hey, are you really asking these questions? Like see tool at first, see it, feel it, and then you, you, you see the success afterwards, right? And I think the last, that's, that's actually tying it to the last point, which is in the face of unknowns and resiliency and adaptability are priorities for manufacturers, which is basically the shift that we're seeing and the, 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 the study that you showed on Gardner, which is shift into composability, right? Yeah, so we had a few questions that came through. Uh, we'll go through those and then uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. Thanks again, Jason and Pablo. So the first question here, uh, what pains do customers tend to solve first in a pilot? Yeah, so I think that the, the pains that customers target it actually goes back to that prioritization grid. You know, it, it really does depend uh, on you know the vertical that we're working with, how you know mature they are in terms of their their technology stack today, but what we do find, at least when companies are coming to Tulip, they they really want to digitize their workflows. You know there are still many companies who are, you know, dealing with you know paper and spreadsheets and whiteboards and and kind of, you know, w ways of of managing the process visibility that isn't you know, giving them the real time visibility they need to understand can, are they having problems and can they adapt quickly to fix those? So I would say predominantly people start to think about what processes do I have that I can digitize and that I can digitize in a way that ultimately makes it easy for an operator to execute. But we have companies who've really done well at digitizing and, and having a standard way for, uh, for doing digitized work instructions, but they don't have great abilities to do, you know, line clearance and quality events and, you know, corrective action planning and all that good stuff. So it all goes back to the grid of where's your highest value impact and, and what can we implement? And you might say the highest value impact is really hard to do. And we might say, it's okay, let's do it. Or you might say there's really high value impact, but it's, it's simple to do. And obviously that's, that's a home run for us. Yeah. And, and in addition to that, I think it's also the ability to scale the processes, right? So traditionally, it's just, you know, if a manufacturing engineer is using PowerPoint to create a PDF and then print it out, how can you actually make that, you know, a digital process where you can actually get data from the, the operator? Because if you have a, a PDF in front of them or a piece of paper, you're missing out on the opportunity to hear your operator and introducing data into a system that's actually sustainable. So we see that too, where you know, customers say, you know, maybe machine monitoring is the first thing they think about, but we go and visit them and say like, hey, but you're missing out on this opportunity to, for better data collection. Oh, I didn't think about this, right? So it, it's more so about looking at the process and feeling the process and being with the customer to say, okay, this is a real pain point and going back to the grid, this is, ha this is a real pain point, which is easy to implement and has the highest impact. Awesome. Thanks. And we have one more question here. Uh, what do you foresee as the future of RFPs? Do you think the industry will eventually adopt a different approach? So it's a, it's a great question. So yes, I think the future of RFPs is changing as the, the, the needs are evolving because it, it, it's, you know, we're in a world and we're adapting to the manufacturing needs, which is basically, you know, you want to see it and feel it first. And basically you're addressing the problems from the shop all the way to the, the top instead of the top down of approach, right? I think eventually the industry will start shifting to that, but there are certain and fundamental questions that are, need to be part of an RFP that need to be documented, right? So for example, cloud native, or how is your architectural uh, technology stack adapting to the current technology environment in a certain, uh, for a certain company? There are things that are pretty standard, but there are also other things that are not being captured by an RFPs. So what I'm seeing is a trend, you know, as a trend is, is shifting that mentality to have standard questions being asked and then very soft, uh, adaptable 
um, questions that are dependent on the manufacturing environment, the product, and, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, and I, I think what I would add is, I, you know, I, I don't anticipate RFPs to fully go away because I do think it's, you know, it's a buying process that, that some companies are comfortable with. I, what I think, to Pablo's point, will happen is already happening. We're seeing people get very prescriptive on some key questions that they just must have, and they're more quickly moving into prove it to me uh, versus, you know, documenting how we do it or how it's expected to be done or what could be done. It's no, show me. So I think that it's it's kind of moving towards maybe a more streamlined R pre process, but where people get to quicker quicker results of this is going to work for me or it's not. Um, I, we've we've been involved in a few you know over the years that have taken years for people to get to a final decision, and you know our goal is to help people you know make that decision. You know whether we're the right fit or not, we certainly hope we are, but we'd rather help you get to that decision much more quickly so you can start getting value versus kind of festering in, in this kind of analysis paralysis of am I making the right choice, you know, across many vendors. Great. Well, um, those are those are all the questions that we have for right now. For any other questions that come through, if you have any other questions on the topic, uh, feel free to follow up with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Pablo, for uh, speaking today. We really appreciate it. A lot of great insights. And uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.